For Krima Media in Johannesburg, I'm Sane Lamini. Professor Albert Hronling is in conversation with Polity about the book titled Slap It, Men on a Mission. So, Professor, this book is about Frederick Van Zyl Slabert, a man who played a role in bringing an end to apartheid in our country. In brief, what do you think uh, his main contribution was to this process? I think one has got to bear in mind that his influence originated during the early 70s already when he joined Parliament as a 33-year-old in 1974, as a member of the Progressive Federal Party. It was a relatively young age to, to join Parliament at that time. And right from that point onwards, he tried to shift the debates in Parliament, try to change the grammar of Parliament. At the time, 74, the main debates were about Afrikaans, English relationships, differences between the National Party, the Progressive Federal Party, which Lovett was a member of Parliament, and what was called the United Party. So it was all about intra-white politics. Slavid moved the debate away from that into much more pressing issues about the issue of apartheid and what was taken at the time as a viable system by the National Party and even the United Party. So from that point onwards, he raised the consciousness of first of all members of parliament and later also further afield uh, in the, amongst the white, uh, the general population amongst the whites. Uh, you've got to bear in mind he came from Afrikaans background from uh, what used to be Petersburg, today Polakwani. And uh, he had quite a checkered history. And I think that helped to shape them to think differently about being white at the time and what it meant to be white during the latter part of the 20th century. So uh, all, of this, all of this fed into raising white consciousness about the issue of apartheid, whether we could carry on that way, whether it could be adapted, whether there should be cosmetic changes and what will that do? It won't really uh, eliminate the gross inequalities and discriminatory practices. So I think in a nutshell, uh, it played a considerable role in raising white consciousness about issues pertaining to apartheid. And can you also reflect on the young uh, Fanzel Slappert now during an incident when where his friends attacked a black man who was in town after the 9 p.m. curfew? That was, uh, was quite unusual for a young man in a place called Petersburg at the time, which was uh, racial issues were, were, were very uh, rough at uh, uh, at a place like Petersburg. Now, it often happens that white side, they grow up with black people on the farm and uh, and therefore they know black people. And of course, that is a oversimplification. But Slavid had black friends on the farm and they were his equal. They, they uh, played together, they discussed matters of a common interest. And from, from a very young age, he was a, uh, uh, he wasn't brought up in the normal kind of apartheid environment where whites hardly ever got into touch with, with black people. So I, I think that played a part. And also because he himself came from a dislocated uh, home where he had to fend for himself. So he often real, he realized that black people or black youngsters also had from, uh, problems with their family break up a family because often because of apartheid legislation. So you could actually identify with that, given his own situation and given a vet of, uh, of, of, of young black youngsters at the time. So that was a, in part, I, I think I argue in the book that that helped to shape his, his racial consciousness uh, about the deleterious effects of apartheid.
While he was uh, at the University of Stellenbosch uh, around 1962, uh, at the age of 22, at the time even the ANC and PAC were banned, he wrote a very interesting piece on how to resolve contradictions in South Africa. Can you tell us about that publication? Yeah, it was, uh, he, he went to study um, to become a minister of religion at Stellenbosch. And Stellenbosch at the time was seen as one of the central building blocks of the apartheid system. And uh, you got to bear in mind that at the time, in the early 60s, it was a almost predominantly black town. The, what was called the township uh, out of uh, close to Stellenbosch, Kayamandi, there were very few black people because of the past laws and the uh, uh, influx control measures, as they were called. So the thinking tend to be white orientated. Now, Slavic comes from a different background. And he realizes that Stalamos people know very little about black people. And he felt that had to be challenged. At the age of 22, he wrote this piece where he challenged the, the, uh, the notion as put forward by the theological faculty that. Uh, God ordained certain structures in society, apartheid being one of them. And he, he, he queried the, the logic of that. For, for Slavid, he had a raised sense of, of politics, of, uh, of a, a political awareness. But because he was such a sharp thinker, it also had to make logical sense. And he couldn't see that apartheid made logical sense. Apart from the moral elements in it, it also just didn't make any sense in, 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 in rational in a rational manner. Now that today seems almost self-evident, but we got to bear in mind that at the time that wasn't self-evident. That was almost a kind of heresy, which he uh, which he broadcasted. So that made it so much. Uh, it was much of a challenge for him to argue in such a way that people who disagree vehemently will at least take his logical arguments uh, on board, because after all, this was a university. It played a part in, uh, in just spreading the word that this system is, is, is not what it built up to be. During his early political life, he also joined a very interesting group, I must say, which is called the Synthesis, which had members yeah. like former IFP leader Mangosutu Butelis. Would you mind telling us about yeah. this group? It was a kind of discussion group. One could also refer it back to Stellenbosch, uh, although Stellenbosch is often uh, depicted as a kind of apartheid university, which it was to some extent. But there were also other groupings within Stellenbosch, uh, discussion groups outside the formal classes, uh, which happened in the town. And, uh, and that gave rise to, an, and, and they were very open and very critical, and uh, they ran everything against the grain. And that's where the idea of since the first originated and was supported by wealthy businessmen later extended further afield to uh, Johannesburg and other places. Served as an early kind of think tank, uh, critically appraising of apartheid. And if I may ask Professor uh, Van Slappert, he also organized a, a very uh, interesting talks uh, that happened in Dakar, Senegal, in which prominent Africaners and others met uh, together with the ANC leaders. I can mention people like Mac Maharaj, Tabom Begi, and yeah. Aziz Pahad. But we know that Tabom Begi uh, first sp spoke in that uh, uh, meeting and he broke the eyes and introduced himself as an Africaner. Can you tell us about those talks? Yeah, that is uh, after Slavet left Parliament and uh, the great controversy in 1986. Because he, the mere fact that he left Parliament, he was the uh, leader of the Progressive Federal Party, uh, it was actually an insult for those who remain in Parliament because Slavet now indicated that Parliament has become superfluous to uh, 
uh, politics in South Africa. Politics happen elsewhere. It happened in the streets, it happened in the township, it happened in protest marches. It happened abroad with what the ANC uh, activities abroad. So all of a sudden, Parliament has been downscaled. And Slavit, when, when he resigned from Parliament, felt he had to uh, ride that wave of extra parliamentary politics. And the organizers meeting, it's a long involved story about how the meeting was, was organized, because at the time, no one was supposed to talk to the ANC, although the government was already talking to the ANC, which wasn't known at the time. And uh, But some of them recruited a number of, um, of uh, what was considered a liberal kind of Afrikaners to join him, about 60 of them, to have a meeting with the ANC in leadership in the car. Afrikaner responses, those Afrikaners who went there, some of them were skeptical about the ANC, but others were quite willing to embrace the ANC because they felt guilty about apartheid. They felt that the National Party has become an embarrassment. And uh, Slavet himself was careful about how he positioned himself but he got along very well with Thabo Mbeke. They were both highly intelligent men and uh, the keen understanding of politics. Uh, they were both very articulate. And there's almost like an immediate chemistry between them to the extent that Slavit at one point said, said that he'll die for that bugger. That is uh, Thabo Mbeke now. The meeting caused an absolute major media frenzy in South Africa, it's the first time that an unofficial delegation has met with the ANC and of a fairly prominent liberal Afrikaners. There was talk about that delegation will be locked up when they come back to South Africa. The government didn't really seriously consider that because they knew it would just uh, fan the flames even more. But that opened up the gateway to a greater consciousness, a greater awareness of the ANC. I'm not saying that that actually led to negotiations in, in, in 1990. There were a lot of other factors which uh, came into play after 87, when Slaviton then went to Dakar. You can factor in the fall of the Berlin Wall. You can factor in continuous insurrections in the country the dire financial straits of the country, the fact that they were unable to uh, obtain uh, investments from overseas, all of those factors played a part and helped to shape the new environment. And one mustn't forget that P.W. Buitas had been replaced by F.W. de Klerk, who was much more pragmatic. But one has got to bear that in mind and not ascribe everything that happened afterwards to, uh, to what happened in the car. And uh, even the ANC, though, was, uh, was surprised at the, with the Clark's announcement. But that, at least they had an inkling from talking to Slubbard about how politics may, may uh, evolve. And it also raised consciousness amongst white people that you can't have any negotiations without the ANC and the release of Mandela, and with that, the blessing of the ANC that he should be released. So in that sense, it kind of paved the way, but uh, one has got to be more specific how it paved the way. So not just to say that it led to the negotiations, it's, a, it's quite a huge oversimplification. It will be interesting to ask Professor as to uh, what contributions did this man also contributed in our in parliament at the time before the ANC was unbanned? He spoke on a number of topics, but always somewhere or the other, the iniquities of apartheid enter, entered into it. And uh, whenever he spoke in parliament, there was people paid attention to what he was saying. It so often happens in parliament that people keep on talking and others fall asleep. Yeah, when, when Slavic spoke, People actually woke up and listened, and, and they were keen to hear him in talk. Uh, people like the clerk, amongst others, 
he thought wise about, about how can he outwit him, but he was really a man who, who caught the attention because he, he spoke to the heart of the matter and uh, it wasn't just playing the fool or just going through the motions. There was a lot of thinking, a lot of commitment, a lot of dedication, and uh, uh, overall, as I try to indicate in the book, he was a man on a mission, and that was to create uh, a South Africa free of discrimination. Now, one can talk about what happened afterwards. That's another complicated story. But in Parliament, I would say his debates, or rather his speeches raised the, the level of debate in, in Parliament. And uh, it made people aware of alternatives, creating alternatives, imagining a different kind of social world and political world. Wow, I must say, he, he was such an amazing man. And, uh, and that phrase that says, a man on a mission is really fitting about this man. And lastly, Professor, what do you think leaders of today could learn from the life of Fanzel Slapin? The one thing he was quite adamant about, and uh, that was that he was dead set against uh, against any form of corruption. I, I think that is an important dimension. And I also think to bear in mind the greater good of the populace, of the voters. And, and, and I think, therefore, the policies have got to be even-handed to... Uh, to make sure that the population as a whole, although they may not agree with everything, can at least buy into that, realizing that it is for the common good. So he, he gave politics a kind of edge of morality and also edge of rationality. So the combination of those two things can be difficult, but I think that's a kind of legacy which he left and which this country can certainly a benefit from. There was Professor Albert Ronling in conversation with Polity about the book titled Slabet Men on a Mission.